Hey, howdy, Warriors. It's uh, time for week two. And this week in our class, we're going to be discussing the trait theory of leadership. So uh, hopefully you've already read the chapter or at least skimmed through it. I always recommend a quick skim through the chapter to look at the subject headings first and then put it down, let those bake for a while, and then come back and read it later. That's a good reading technique. It uh, can be a little dry all at once straight through. Okay, So feel free to find the best way uh, that works for you in, when reading those chapters. You don't have to just sit down and grind it out till it's done. Take it in little pieces, uh, skim it, review it, and then come back to it later or something like that. It's, it's always helpful. Okay, let's get into our lesson this week. Uh, this week in managing maintenance organizations and people, we're talking about the trade approach. We're going to be covering these topics in the lecture today, sort of the major headings out of the, the chapter this week. So let's get right into it. All right, the trade approach. Uh, recall from last week that up to World War II, leadership is defined as something you're born with, right? The great man theory. Um, picture from this time period, early, you know, from the 1940s uh, earlier, uh, sort of great captains of industry. You've got um, J.P. Morgan, bankers, you know, industrialists. Uh, so think back to movies you may have seen that portray leaders in this sort of larger-than-life figure, um, power suits and all. So that's that's kind of uh, where we're coming from with the trait uh, leadership theory. Okay, so researchers uh, were started to attempt to define these traits, right? Because it's useful to to know what they are, so that you can start looking for people who have them. Uh, mostly through what's called qualitative means. When you're doing research, this is just an aside note. Um, the, the word qualitative means basically through storytelling, through gathering stories from people. So an interview, uh, what makes a great leader, people would say you can note that and turn that into a research project. Uh, the other side of, of qualitative would be the quantitative uh, means of research. That's where we're studying actual numbers. Let's take a look at, um, you know, heart attacks uh, after age 50 in this particular group. Okay, so that's looking at hard numbers to, to glean something from those numbers. Qualitative means we're going to listen to people and we're going to find common points in their stories. All right, just a little side note there. Okay, so by the 1940s, uh, research was showing that the traits made uh, a leader in some, that made a leader in some situations didn't, didn't always help in others. So we're starting to, to realize that maybe the trait theory is not airtight, okay? Uh, there's still many aspects of it that are useful even today, uh, but it started to show some of the some of the chinks in the armor um, where it maybe was not quite the the catch-all theory that people thought it was. Okay, so eventually, trait uh, leadership came to be seen as contextual, uh, only implying in certain situations. That means it's context sensitive. What makes you a great leader leader uh, with these traits in one uh, specific case may not necessarily make you a great leader in others. Okay, And that is what sort of led to the explosion of studies uh, that you see uh, starting in the 1950s and certainly increasing quite a bit uh, in the 80s and 90s where people really started to dig in and study leadership. And that's, that's what this textbook, uh, Leadership, is based on uh, all that research. So take a look at Table 2.1. You can pause this for a minute and go take a look at it in your book, uh, you're going to see uh, a list of traits that were defined by different studies, lots of different studies in there, and also the time period of those studies. I want to see if you can map those traits to social patterns that might have existed during the time that those studies were created. I think it's personally interesting to, to note how the times, uh, the cultural um, environment shapes what we're looking for and maybe even what we're finding uh, in, those, in those studies when we're, when we're looking at what makes a good leader. So take a little pause, uh, go look at that, and then come back. All right. So the text uh, takes all those studies and does its own little study and boils it down to five traits that, that, the, that the author feels uh, encompasses most of what you're going to see in Table 2.1. So those are intelligence, self-confidence, oops, determination, integrity, and sociability. Um, if this were a movie, uh, that would be the hero, right? That is, uh, I mean, let's take a look 
told you I was a nerd before. Let's take a look at uh, the Avengers, right? Captain America, pretty much summed up in those right there. Tony Stark, not so much the last one with the sociability. Definitely not the Hulk, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, look, that, that's intelligence, self-confidence, determination, integrity, sociability. That's what you definitely would call sort of a hero archetype. Uh, if, you know, in reading, uh, that's a lot of what our heroes are made out of and in movies too. So why not, uh, identify our leaders, uh, the same way? It's, it's kind of a natural grouping, uh, with those traits. All right, let's take a little closer look at these. Intelligence. So leaders tend to have a higher, uh, intelligence, uh, or higher average intelligence than their followers. That's not just an opinion. That is based on a lot of studies. Uh, now, there's a bunch of different ways to measure intelligence. It doesn't necessarily mean IQ, okay? Uh, matter of fact, IQ is a pretty slippery um, thing to define. If, if you take a test online that tells, it's going to tell you what your IQ is, it's, uh, no, it's not really doing that. Um, that's a very complex um, series of tests, and, and it takes some interpretation as well. So let's do take a look at... Uh, what, what you can measure a little, little bit easier. That's verbal ability, the ability to speak clear, uh, you know, with intention and make your point. That's a type of intelligence, perceptual ability, uh, the ability to see a situation and figure out what's going on. Reasoning skills, the uh, ability to sort of think your way through a problem, right? Um, there's also a theory of multiple intelligences, um, which means it's not all about book smarts. Someone can be a lot of us in maintenance, right? We are, we are um, intelligent when it comes to kinesthetics. That means the ability to manipulate things uh, or intelligent when it comes to how things work. It doesn't mean we, we may not be a, a great verbal uh, mind, <laughs> all right? Uh, we're probably pretty good at perception because that's how you troubleshoot. Um, but don't get caught up in thinking that there is only one kind of intelligence and that equates to, you know, a PhD in a, in a white lab coat somewhere. Um, there are lots of kinds of intelligences, okay? And there's this, such a thing as being intelligent in some ways and lacking in others. Uh, first example that popped to my mind is you could be brilliant, um, but you may lack in social or emotional intelligence, right? So think Sheldon from the, the Big Bang Theory. You don't have to have watched that show to know that he's a really smart guy who can't relate to people at all. Um, sort of a Mr. Spock type character. All right, let's look at self-confidence. Um, certainty about one's competencies and skills. You're, you're positive that, you can, that you're good at stuff, right? You're, you're, you're confident in that. Uh, you've got typically a high self-esteem and, and self-assurance. You don't doubt yourself. You move forward uh, with confidence on things and a belief that you can make a difference. This is big. Um, so a lot of self-confidence is wrapped up in, in the ability to get things um, changed, right? And, and that's a big part we've already defined about what a, the difference between a leader and a manager is, is manager manages, leaders enact change, whether it's big or small scale. All right. But I have a little question for you to ponder next time you're driving on the way to work. Uh, is this the kind of thing that you can fake for very long? Think about people who you've known who were self-confident but didn't really have the chops to back it up. So false self-confidence is definitely not a good leadership trait. Let's talk about determination. There's a difference between self-confidence and determination. You may be a little weak in your self-confidence, but you're still going to be determined to get something done, to overcome problems, right? So there's a, there's always a desire to get the job done, uh, a willingness to assert yourself and be proactive and persevere. It's not easy for everybody. Um, yeah, and you have to want, this is not in the book, this is just from, from me, uh, you have to want what your wants lead you to, right? You might want to open your own shop someday, uh, but... You, that means you're going to have to spend a lot of time learning from others first. Uh, in AMP school that I taught, we had a lot of students come in with the intention of opening a shop immediately upon graduation. And while they were a student, they realized um, that that was going to take some time first. But they were okay with that. They're like, okay, I'll go get a career and I'll go work for a little while and I'll learn from others and then I'll open that shop. They, they didn't um, give up on their goal. They just let reality inform their goal. 
and they were still determined to do it. And I've got a little personal example here um, of, of lack of determination. I, I had uh, a friend who always said, I want to go to the Grand Canyon all the time. And for a while, really said that uh, often. And I got kind of not tired of it, but I just felt like challenging that idea a little bit. I said, no, you don't want to go to the Grand Canyon. And he said, what? Said, of course I do. I said, no, if you wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, you'd be doing something about it. What's keeping you from going to the Grand Canyon? Well, I don't have enough money. Okay, well, you're not doing anything on Friday nights and the weekends. Why don't you go deliver pizzas and put that money in a savings account? And in a year, you can go to the Grand Canyon. And he kind of scoffed and gave me a dirty look because... <laughs> Probably shouldn't open my mouth that way, but I did. Um, but it, it illustrates a point here. The person wanted to go to the Grand Canyon, but he didn't have determination. So it was was it ever going to happen? No, probably not. All right. Let's talk about integrity. That means honesty. You're going to deal with people honestly. It's not just not telling a lie. That also means uh, getting your paperwork done right. When you screw up, you tell your supervisor, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, trustworthiness that means people can come to you and you know your word is your bond kind of a situation you're going to stick to your principles uh, you're not going to be easily swayed uh, in order to gain something you're not going to throw out your ideals or your principles um, the f kind of a phrase that you hear a lot people who do the same thing even when no one is watching right that's integrity okay another Another drive on the way to work pondering question. Um, can you exhibit integrity and still compromise in a negotiation? I've known people who's, who felt in order to stick to their principles, they couldn't give an inch. Um, and that's not the case. And it certainly doesn't lead to, um, to, to good leadership habits or in this case traits. So think about that though for a while. Where, what is that line uh, where you can, Still maintain your integrity, but also compromise in a negotiation. What What is the sort of go, no-go uh, situation? Just think about that on your own. All right, what's next? Sociability. All right, this is pretty important for leaders. Um, and in my opinion, this is one of the ones that's lacking uh, tremendously. Uh, you seek out pleasant social relationships. You're friendly, outgoing, and diplomatic. Diplomatic being very key there. Uh, diplomacy is the ability to um, work with someone, even if you disagree with them, okay? Um, you're aware of others' needs, and you can show concern for others' well-being. Uh, I think we can all agree, and I bet everyone's had at least one boss somewhere who seemed to be completely lacking in the sociability um, arena. So, and, and this gets talked about sometimes in discussion boards, um, what do I, what do I do when I'm friendly with my coworkers, but now I've got to discipline them? That's something you're as a, as a future leader or current leader who's uh, getting their degree, um, you need to think about, uh, it's tricky. And I don't know that I have the answer for that. Um, we, we see that in the discussion board sometimes. Okay. Here's another question for you to ponder. Does being sociable make you an easy target for getting taken advantage of? Um, it can happen for sure, especially if, if, if you have people who perceive sociability as a weakness and not a strong trait. Um, so think about that. What are those lines? When is, when is it cross the line? Um, and when do you have to set aside being sociable in order to, um, sort of maintain that leadership role? Something to think about. Come on, PowerPoint. Here we go. Okay. The book discusses, uh, another set of uh, traits called the five factors personality model doesn't go into as much detail on these this is the result of a large meta-analysis there's another research term uh, that means a study of other studies if i wanted to research a question uh, and i needed a lot of data and i don't want to wait 10 years to gather all that data i can go look at other studies that maybe weren't gathering this data for for their purposes but they happen to be gathering the same data that i wanted so I can go back and look at uh, other studies. That's called a, a meta-analysis. Okay, so they uh, also found five significant factors. And one was uh, neuroticism, low neuroticism, very important. Uh, so someone who has a low neuroticism score is, is someone who, who can hang in there. They're not, um, they're, they're not going off the wall, right? They seem to act in a stable way. Um, 
so that sort of mental stability is very important for, for a good leader. Uh, extroversion, similar to the um, the previous set of five, uh, where you're 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 outgoing, uh, you're you're not afraid to speak up. Afraid is probably not the right word. You're you're comfortable speaking up. Um, you're open. This is a big one too. Um, is you're open to other people's ideas. You're not a closed wall. A good leader is going to listen to the people around them and evaluate uh, before making the decision. They still have to make the decision. But they're going to be open to input up until that point where they have to make the decision. So openness is highly important. Uh, agreeableness, it's similar to the sociability. And conscientiousness, that means, uh, it's kind of like integrity. Uh, that's a, You could define that as your work ethic, right? We're going to get the job done. I'm going to work hard. I'm being paid. Uh, I'm going to give it my best. So those are our five traits uh, identified under the five factors personality model. So the study showed that those personality traits correlate to effective leadership. Um, there's another researcher term, correlate. Correlate means it's associated, it seems to have something to do with it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the cause of it, okay? Correlation is not causation. You hear that a lot, especially if you're doing a, any kind of a research-based program. Um, one correlation that, that might actually be causation is uh, that I think of is several years ago uh, one of the versions of Grand Theft Auto came out and petty crime in Los Angeles dropped like 80% for three days <laughs> because everybody was playing Grand Theft Auto. That's an, uh, actually a, a, a case where um, the data says, hey, a game came out and crime went down. Well, that, that correlates and it might actually be the cause. So there's a, an example of where correlation could very well be causation. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, extroversion was the most strongly associated factor for leadership, so that, that ability to step out and be noticed and be seen. Uh, so if you don't feel that you're an extrovert, that's something you have to consider when seeking a leadership position. Uh, it, it, that's, again, so this is a good example of correlation does not equal causation. It doesn't mean you have to be extroverted. It just means that there is a correlation between extroversion and the ability to get that, land that job as a leader. It doesn't mean you can't overcome it. Okay, then conscientiousness, openness, and low neuroticism were the next in descending order, and agreeableness was only loosely associated. So that doesn't mean uh, that you have to get along with everybody to be their boss, um, and there's certainly plenty of examples of that. Uh, I'm sure you could sort of take a middle position on that, where you're not, you know, everybody's buddy, uh, or that guy who everyone, you know, fears to approach. You can be somewhere in the middle and 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 still be... Uh, it actually might be your best target um, to, to be a, a, an effective leader. All right, another study, conscientiousness, was found to have strong correlation to overall job performance. That's for everybody, right? And that maps, that maps out. That's that good uh, work ethic that you hear about. All right, let's talk about one more way to look at this, and that's strengths in leadership. As time has gone on, uh, we've kind of stopped using the term traits, and started using the term strengths. I don't know the motivation behind that, but that seems to be what we call them today. So, mod, you know, books written in the last 15 years, you might see somebody talk about their strengths, not their traits. Strengths uh, are the ability to consistently demonstrate excellent work. So you might be strong in one kind of work, not the other. Um, strengths advocates will say that leaders know their strengths and leverage those use, those, use those strengths, but they're also good at using the strengths of others around them. That's how they get noticed and how they get leadership positions uh, or, or uh, rise to leadership positions. So it's also, this is interesting, knowing your strengths also means that you know your underutilized strengths and your weaknesses, which takes a certain amount of self-reflection, right? You've, you, you've, you've got to be able to deal straight with yourself to know that you're not um, being too overconfident, right? That's think back to what we just talked about with, with confidence um, and sort of uh, self-assuredness. There's such a thing as being overconfident, over self-assured when you uh, can ignore the fact that you actually do have weaknesses and underutilized strengths. Someone who's um, going to be an effective leader has to know about those, that part of themselves as well. And the way you get there is through developing your emotional intelligence. All right. Uh, emotional intelligence, which we talked a little bit with um, uh, Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, uh, who lacks it severely. Uh, is the ability to perceive and express your own emotions, okay? 
you use those emotions to facilitate your thinking. And then you understand and reason with those emotions. You, it, it's okay to pull those emotions up and know where you're coming from, right? We get a lot of pressure uh, to not use emotions in our, in our thinking and in our decisions. Um, maybe that's because if we're not very good at knowing our motivations and, and the emotions that underlie those, that can lead us to making bad decisions, right? Rash decisions. You know, don't, don't ever send an email when you're angry. That's good advice. Um, go ahead and write that angry email and, uh, then hit delete because it's then you're actually, uh, expressing some emotional intelligence because you're, you're analyzing that and taking a look at it. Uh, yeah, just don't sit, don't, don't hit send. Um, so when we, when we can do these things, we can enter into, um, discussions, uh, and situations at work where we know where we're coming from. We know why we're getting excited about this topic and we could probably approach it a little more rationally and calmly, but also we might be able to see where the other person is coming from. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but if you can work on your emotional intelligence, you might see why the person that you're having a conflict with at work or the person on your team, where they're coming from and why, and that might help inform your decision or your approach to dealing with the conflict. So there, there we are managing it in ourself and others. Um, there's lots of tools that you, that'll help you measure your emotional intelligence. You can look for them. It's not quite as slippery as uh, an IQ test. So if you want to explore that further, uh, I'm sure a Google search would point you to some useful tools at some point. But let me ask you to do this. Um, I want you to take a minute and hit pause again. Think of situations at work that may have had a more positive outcome if everybody involved took the time to understand from an emotionally intelligent perspective. Okay, take some time to think about that. Hit pause and come back to me in a few minutes. Okay. All right. So what would that situation have looked like if everyone involved was better at understanding their own motivations and took time to consider how others in the situation were coming at the problem. Now, this sounds a lot like uh, political correct uh, language. All right. Um, and I'm gonna, I've said it before. I'll say it again. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from how to run your business. Okay. Would skill and emotional intelligence have produced a better outcome for the company and increased the bottom line? That's where I'm coming at you guys when, when uh, we're sort of dancing around what, what's, what you could casually call maybe a PC statement like understanding your emotions or of the emotions of the people around you. I'm not interested in, in uh, meeting someone's agenda. Uh, what I am interested in is giving you the tools and the skills to approach a situation as a leader where you're going to actually have an effective outcome. Okay? Always. That's where I'm coming from. Just want to keep iterating that. Keep uh, reminding you of that. All right. Come on, PowerPoint. Here we go. So how does it work? The trade approach. So the trade approach focuses primarily on the leader without a whole lot of emphasis on the follower or the situation. The trade approach is concerned with what makes great leaders, and that's it. Um, the trade approach says organizations will be successful if they can identify the traits they are looking for and identify them in applicants to positions. Uh, my brother happens to have a career in doing exactly that. He he designs studies that help people understand uh, the people that they're considering for hiring. It's a whole industry around that. Um, trait assessment can help anyone in the organization see how they are perceived by their leaders. So it's good to, for you too, as someone who may or may not be a, a higher level leader, to understand how your traits come off. Because if your organization really does embrace the trait approach, um, you might want to work on the, the areas that you that you see that you're lacking in. Okay, and it's going to help you. All right. So here's some strengths of the trade approach. It's easily understandable, right? Fits with modern society. That's what I was talking about with our books and movies, uh, popular culture. Uh, the leaders have certain traits, and we can easily identify those in our fiction. Um, well, that, that, that maps over to reality as well. Uh, it's one of the most research theories available, which means it's got lots of backup. Lots of people have come to the same conclusions. That's just, that, that makes for strong research. Um, it only focuses on the leader, so it's, it's more direct. We're not messing around with a very complicated thing. If I study something from three different vectors, uh, it makes for a much more complicated study. So it gives us some useful benchmarks for judging leaders. It's very easy. Here's leader. Here's the traits. Do they line up? Yes. Do they line up? No. 
All right, let's talk about the criticisms. It's not perfect. Uh, after 100 years of research, we don't have a solid answer. Uh, we can't point to five exact things. The book distills it down, but, um, but it's still not real precise. All right. It ignores different situations, the contextual leadership. My note here is to remind me to tell you the story of the movie Planet of Dinosaurs. Uh, I like to watch really bad uh, sci-fi and horror films. That I think they're a hoot. And just watched one recently where um, someone in this party that crash lands on a planet full of dinosaurs, because it's a bad movie, uh, was the vice president of the company. Something made him the vice president, but on this planet of dinosaurs, he was terrible. And he happens to be the second person to get killed. So um, he, he may be a strong leader in the boardroom, but he was a terrible leader in a survival situation. All right. Uh, it's highly subjective and lends itself to echo chamber reinforcement. Okay. In a $30, $366 billion annual worldwide industry, who's right? You can find a book to back up anything you already believe. If you believe that to be an effective leader, you have to be over six feet tall. Um, you could probably find a series of books, uh, a bunch of books written by independent authors who will back you up in that. So this is the downside of having so much research done on it. There's also uh, a lot of possible answers. And so it's easy to find the one that already fits your mental map uh, of the way things are. Um, it doesn't study how the traits affect the followers. Okay, so maybe we do need to be a little more complex. While that was a strength, it's also a weakness. And then this, and this one's not in the book, uh, but I want to add it. It does leave itself open to biases. Um, biases. Look at the table 2.1 again. Um, and, and look at the 1950s list. And then think of the TV show Mad Men, right? All the leaders in Mad Men are, you know, fit uh, a lot of these traits, one of which is masculine, okay? So that means that if we're holding uh, masculinity up as a trait for leadership, that leaves out about half the population. Um, so, I, and I've, I've known women in leadership, uh, who struggle, uh, uh, because it's not, not anything they're doing, um, they're following these traits, not necessarily masculine, but the, but the more refined, uh, five traits that the book identifies, but those can be by some people perceived as traits in, in, when you're talking about gender norms as masculine traits. So when someone who is culturally expected to have feminine traits exhibits the masculine traits, it can be uh, a bit off-putting to people. Now, is that the, the, the leader's fault or problem? It's not their fault, but it becomes <laughs> their problem uh, when, when they've got folks who won't give them a chance or a break because of preconceived notions or because someone uh, operating outside of uh, what we uh, culturally expect them to, how they, how, how they should behave um, is different. So think about that. Um, that's another thing to think about on the drive to work uh, is how this, this trade approach leaves itself open to biases. That's one example. There's, I'm sure there's plenty of other ones. All right. So summary, uh, just a reminder, each book in the chapter has a summary section. That's going to be your best study guide when it comes to quizzes. You don't need me to produce anything. It's already there for you. Okay. If it's in the summary, it's likely going to be on a quiz. Summaries are like a page and a half, so it's not too bad. Uh, that doesn't excuse you from reading the whole chapter because you're going to need to heavily uh, rely on the information in the chapter in your discussions and also for your final paper, which we'll be talking about shortly, um, where you're going to need to really dig in deep to these chapters. Okay, let's in just a minute um, talk about your, your activity this week, which is the leadership instrument. This is the first time you're going to do one of these. Uh, so it's going to be vital for you to engage in that leadership instrument early in the week, which means I hope you're watching this lecture on Monday and getting your chapter read um, before Monday because you've already got your book, I hope. Uh, you don't need to wait for the week to come to read ahead. Uh, your discussion this week is going to be based on the results that you collect from performing the activity. The goal is to learn about how people around you perceive several traits used in trait theory and compare those to your own self-perception. So we're going to do a little emotional intelligence uh, exercise here. We're going to see how you handle being told from other people um, how they see you uh, in terms of trait theory after you've already decided how you see you. So I bet they don't line up. You might be surprised. Uh, so select five people who you trust to be honest with you and give you well-considered answers. You may have a buddy at work who will, you know, circle all the ones or something. So don't talk to that guy. Um, 
you can make photocopies of the page. It's perfectly fine. It says right there on the page that you can do that. So that is not an ethics problem. It's not a copyright problem. Uh, take the assessment yourself before you look at the other five responses and then score the test. Okay. So what we're going to do with that is that's going to inform you when responding to the primary question in this week's discussion. So you're going to have to complete the scoring of the questionnaire in time to make your first post on Thursday. And then before Sunday at 11.59 p.m., uh, ask questions to at least two of your fellow students and answer any questions that come your way. So don't delay. It might take your participants a day or so to get those results back to you. And I'm looking very forward to discussing the results with you. I think that's going to be a fascinating discussion. And I hope we're um, pleasantly surprised. And uh, I also hope that we use this as a chance to learn something about ourselves. Okay? So that's this week's lecture. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Y'all have a good day.